Hi everybody, welcome to another Park Report Podcast interview. This is Roy. My guest on this episode is Marillion drummer Ian Mosley. The band have a new live album on the way called An Hour Before It's Dark, Live in Port Zealand. Comes out on June 21st. I had a chance to talk with Ian about the live record, playing that album over the Marillion weekend, and touring, and a whole lot more. But before we get started, just a reminder to subscribe to YouTube channel, wherever you get your podcasts, follow us on all our socials and parkwork.com. And don't forget to check out our Spotify new progressive rock playlist for music from Marillion and a lot of other great bands. And now my chat with Ian Mosley of Marillion. Hello. How are you? Good. Good to, uh, good to meet you, actually. You know what's funny? Um, I, am, I, I don't know if you know, but I'm one of the hosts on the uh, Cruise to the Edge. With, all right. Um, yeah, with John Kirkman and and uh, and all those guys, and um, but I never actually have gotten a chance to uh, to say hi to you or or meet you in person while on the ship. It's always so busy, you know, as you know. Oh, oh, that's a shame we didn't meet up. But I I enjoyed it a lot. The the, the last cruise, well, the last couple of cruises we've done, I've really enjoyed. Yeah. It. Just the yeah, you. The, the social side of it for me is great because there's lots of people I haven't seen for years, and like Simon Phillips, the really good friend, and yeah. uh, and the Steve Hackett band, of course, because I was with Steve for a few years before Maroon. Right. So um, yeah, you get to meet a lot of uh, a lot of friends from the from the music world, and uh, and and you know. Uh, you guys, I think, come on it about every other year. It seems like usually, you know, on the off years from the Marillion weekends, I guess. Um, yeah. And uh, but man, it's such a it it blows my mind because, you know, being uh, running around there doing all my chores that I have to do on the ship, I don't get to I get to watch very few full concerts. You know, I I get to peek in here and there and stuff like that. And I always try to catch at least some of your shows. And uh, but man, the response is uh, even to this last one. It's it's always amazing to me. You're, the the fans just they just love you guys so much. It's got to be crazy to to experience that in and them walking around with them and they get you know they're all saying hi to you on the ship and all of that. What is that like for you guys on the ship? Oh, oh, it's great. I mean, they're they're very very respectful. You know, as far as our, yeah. our personal space, everybody. Um, so it's it's always kind of a pleasure. But yeah, the our fan our fans are. I mean, they're just amazing. They really are. I mean, they've they've stuck by us for what four forty odd years. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's wild, right? It's pretty amazing. I know. They're, everyone's getting very old. I've noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> well, what are you gonna do? Uh, but you guys are still kicking ass. That's for sure. Um, I do want to shout out to uh, to Pete. Uh, he's doing okay now. He wasn't on the he wasn't on the cruise, obviously, and. Uh, but I, it looks like he's up and up and about again. Yeah, yeah, it was. Um, yeah, it was quite disturbing. I mean, um, I've got to give a shout out actually to Nick Beggs. Did an well, I was going to ask you about job. Nick. Sure. Yeah, he did an amazing job for us because he only had a week or two to, to to rehearse quite a lot of the material, and he did lots of homework. And it was a real pleasure working with him because he's he's such a nice guy, but. But yeah, it was a shock. Um, you know, me and Pete have been partners in crime as a rhythm section for for the last thirty or forty years. So suddenly, for him not to be there, um, it it was a shock. So, but he's doing very well, really well. I mean, I saw him about a week after his operation, and it looked like it was like something out of a Frankenstein film. You know, it was <laughs> unbelievable. Um, but then uh, I saw him, you know, when we got back from the cruise, and uh, he's really doing well. He looks great. I mean, he's he's quite fit. He's quite a fit guy, so it's, sure. it's quite strange. Um, and we've been in the studio for the last week or two, just jamming, and he's been with us every day, and he's doing well. He's on the, he's having physiotherapy now for the next couple of months on every Wednesday. So um, right. So, but good, yeah, good. he's he, he's on the mend. He's looking good, and um, yeah, touch wood. I think it's it's yeah, a long yeah. old process, you know. But we we uh we love Pete. We're rooting for him. And uh, so, how did uh, Nick get involved with uh, playing with you guys exactly? How who who decided to give him a call? <laughs> well, you know, we've known Nick. I've known Nick for at least I don't know thirty years on and off. You know, we cross paths and um, yeah. 
and um, he he'd been working, I think, with Steve Wilson uh, band. He did some tours with him. I think he's worked with Hackett as well. So, and he he lives probably fifteen minutes from me, where I live, from where I live. Oh, wow. <laughs> and uh, so, as I said, we've we've crossed paths over the years, and I've always got on very well with him. Well, the whole band's always got on very well with him. And uh, on the last tour we did, he um, he supported us with his with his daughters, oh, Nick Beggs and his daughter. Yeah, so. Uh, and that was that was really good. So I was just sitting here and I was thinking about what we could do, because originally we thought, well, we could do what um, Porcupine Tree did um, when they they lost their bass player just before a tour. And they put all the bass parts in a box, if you like, right. and, and just replayed it all. So they didn't have a bass player live. And I was sitting here thinking... It just wouldn't feel right, you know. And I, I thought, who's on the cruise? Who could we get to just come up and, and play even just a few numbers with us? Right. So there was, you know, uh, Ryan Old, the guy from um, Steve Hackett Band. I thought, thought him. And then I went through this list and I thought, I wonder what Nick Beggs is doing. So I called. I just called him and said, Nick, I, I thought there's no way he'll be available because he's always so busy. And I just gave him a call, or Lucy, our manager, gave him a call first. And then I spoke to him and I said, you know, are you available? And he said, yes. I just, what? <laughs> <laughs> and and I had that kind of embarrassing, which is always embarrassing. I thought, well, I wonder how much he's going to want to do this, you know. And, and he right. said, whatever, what he's, he just said to me, whatever the budget is, I'll do it. You know, that, that and that was it. That's how it came about. And. I spoke to the rest of the band, and they were just thought that's perfect, you know, because um, he really he's, he he's followed the band for a long, long time, and um, the rest of the band just thought, yeah, it's great. And from what I've seen from the fans' reactions, they they enjoyed our choice of Nick on bass. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he's definitely. In in prog circles and music circles, he's known to be a, a pro and an amazing player, and um, yeah, did a certainly respected the music, you know, as as I think you had no doubt he would. So, uh, yeah, oh, he, that he, was a solid, he, solid choice. Yeah, yeah, he really did. I mean, he's he, the first day of rehearsal. He said, "Ian, you know, tell me if if I'm overplaying. Tell me if I said, Nick, just do whatever you want, really." And as you <laughs> said, he totally. He totally respected the, the music, and um, and it's a shame in a way that we only had the two gigs, you know, on the cruise, um, right? Because because with the the Marillion, it always takes us a, a week to get it together when we're touring, anyway. But but we rehearsed a lot, and it did us a lot of good as a band having Nick in the studio because everyone thought, oh, oh, we better, you know, we've got a professional with us, we better pull our fingers out and make sure we're good so <laughs> so all the boys you know work to put a little bit more effort in i think so but as i said he's just a lovely guy so. nice no cool i'm glad i got to ask you about that uh but the reason why we're we have you on here is uh the new live record uh an mm. hour before it's dark uh, I'm, i don't know if i'm saying this correctly but it's live in port zeland is that right yes yeah i thought okay yeah. great um yeah out of uh the netherlands uh you guys recorded it in, in uh looks like march of, of last year over the marillion weekend um great sounding live record you got the full new album some other songs in there uh you know talk about that that weekend of putting those shows together what was that like and what made it um i mean were you recording other concerts also and then this one was the best one or you had planned to record this one over that weekend how they come about yeah, we 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 planned on on recording that one because it um, the Port Zealand convention is kind of the flagship one for us. You know, it, it's the one that uh, we put in as much production as we can and uh, kind of experiment a bit, really. But it's it's always been kind of daunting that you know we, we I think we kind of raised the bar quite a lot when we, one of the conventions we played the Brave album, the complete Brave album, and that kind of raised the bar for us. And we thought, okay, the next convention, 
what the hell are we going to do to try and top that? And uh, so a lot of sort of thought and effort is put into them all. And this time around, yeah, we we just thought we we call Port Zealand. We got the uh, the string quartet involved, and we had uh, Louis Jardine on percussion with us, who played on the album as well. And he's always a massive pleasure to have have around. I mean, apart from being an amazing talent, he's just I mean, he's played with so many legends so right. it's an honor to have him sitting next to me on stage and and um and he really helps me out um so yeah so we had lewis on percussion uh the girls uh, string quartet which mike hunter had, had, our producer had written out some arrangements for and <clears throat> we just thought well let's let's go for it let's try and uh, record it and and see what happens um but it it all went really well. It was good. It's really uh, good. yeah. I mean, it's, it's an album that uh, <laughs> man. It's isn't it crazy to think it's been two years now since that that album came out? Do you ever <laughs> do you ever yeah. like just almost think about? Can you remember what it was like making the record and 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 what was and what you guys were going through at the time and putting that album together? through then now you're playing it in full live the, the 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 sort of evolution of creating those songs and then performing it yeah it's it's kind of a mystery really you know when i, I just before a tour i always sit down that's probably the only time i really listen to our our albums is before a tour when i have to learn all the drum parts and learn and right. see, hear what's going on um and i yeah i i'd listen to an hour before it's dark, before we started rehearsing it, and I just thought, well, how how did we get this together? You know, how? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and um, I mean, the way Marillion write, I mean, it's kind of well known. It, it's that everything is created just from jamming. Yeah. So it's the five five of us in a room just jamming, and we record, or Mike Hunter records every single thing that we jam. So it's a very long, long process. Um, I mean, it's it's very organic, but it it can be very frustrating. It can take forever. You know, we can be in the studio for a week, and nothing happens, and then suddenly we can be in for a couple of days, and we'll kind of hit a bit of a gold seam, and suddenly loads of things will happen. But um, Mike records every single thing, and then he'll from that the process is he'll probably send us round he said guys I've got 50 pieces of music here just snippets of music I'm going to send them all to you pick out your favorite top 10 from all the all the snippets of jams so he sent all those round it was about 50 pieces I think and we all cho chose off um, our favorite pieces huh. and, and then we when Mike went through it all, he said, I can't believe you lot. None of you picked the same thing. <laughs> 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 so anyway, we kind of whittled it down to, you know, having sort of between five and ten favourites each. And then Mike went away and he started uh, joining some of the things together and doing some kind of bits of arrangements. Then he, he called us all in and we had a playback. And then out of those sort of probably 10 or 12 ideas, um, we picked favorites from that. And that's when we'd go back in the studio as a band and start playing around with those ideas and start arranging some of the music. Um, still just jamming, you know, we might get to, a, say, a, a chorus part of, um, uh, say, um, Murder Machines and, Michael just said, just jam around the chorus and see if we can make more of it or see where it goes. So that's how the things were constructed. At the same time, Steve Hogarth is trying to match up lyrics to the music as well. Um, so so is he in there? Is he there with you guys while you're jamming and, and sort of throwing just melodies at, at you guys or trying to fit in some lines? How is how is he fitting in that while you guys are doing those parts? What Steve Hogarth? Yeah, yeah, he's he's uh, all the time we're jamming. 
But we've been jamming for the last two weeks and we were in, we were in the studio yesterday and we were jamming a, a thing that sounded really nice. And then Steve will scan some of his lyrics that he's new lyrics that he's got over that piece of music, just trying to see if they match up. And, and uh, we had a couple of good days this week, actually, where some of the, the vocals sounded really good. And, but they're spontaneous, very spontaneous. Right. But we it's came... a really unique way to write. I mean, it's not it's not a, a way you hear a lot of bands coming up with music. It's really, I mean, you guys always do your uh, your own unique thing, it seems like. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, as I said, it can, it can be very frustrating because, you know, I, over the whole career of Marillion, I don't think, I'm just trying to think, I don't think anyone has ever come into the studio and said, guys, I've got a song here. Have a listen. You know, wow. that, I, I can't ever remember that happening. <laughs> That's you know, amazing. Someone might, someone might come in and say, "I've got a great guitar riff," or, or, or Mark or the keyboards and say, "I've got this part. What do you think?" Um, and then, but at the end of it, or we'll, we'll, if we like something, then we'll just jam around it and see how it develops. Um, yeah. But thank, thank God, Mike records every single thing because. You know, I mean, Steve Rothery can play an amazing guitar part. And I'll say to Steve, Steve, that guitar part you just played, do it again. That sounded great. And he'll go, what? <laughs> you know? Thank <laughs> oh. so, um, God, there's we, tape. That's amazing. Yeah, it really is. And uh, But even back in the days before digital, you know, we, we, were, we were recording stuff on cassette players. And so it's always kind of been like that. Um, but the process for um, an hour before it started was a little strange because of the whole COVID situation. Right. And, you know, the, we always like to have the five of us in the studio and jam as a band. And um, Steve Rothery got... Uh, Steve Rothery was in a bit of a panic when the COVID thing hit um, because he's diabetic and hmm. he was felt very vulnerable um so steve didn't come into the studio for quite a few weeks it was just the the kind of four of us and we screened off all the studio was uh, screened off you know i mean i'm in a drum booth anyway i'm always in i'm always screened off <laughs> right <laughs> uh, but but the rest of us everyone was petitioned off you know so um, yeah so but it, so we were sending stuff to Steve Rothery at home because he's got a home studio and letting him jam around some of those ideas that we had at home. And then he'd, he'd put a guitar part on and send it back to us. But that kind of set us back a few months as um, far as the writing, the writing sessions went. But when uh, Steve came back, Things got very productive very quickly, actually, when he was back in the studio, and it was the five of us again in together. <clears throat> the process for your drums in particular, once all the writing is done and everything is arranged and sorted out, so do you then go and lay down your drums first before everybody starts tracking things, or are you, are you recording things live together? We're recording things the majority of it is live together um but the the recording process for me over the last decade or two has, has changed um mm -hmm. whereas at one time i kind of miss it in a way um one time i'd you know we'd re rehearse stuff before we went in to record it and then we'd go in and as you say i'd in the early days i'd record the backing tracks or i'd record the drum tracks probably take a week between seven days or 10 days do all the drums and then the overdub process would begin and that right. used to be my favorite time i'd be sitting in the control room every day <laughs> listening to stuff growing you know as yeah. people were coming in i used to love that because i thought well i've done my bit now i can just relax and, and chill and and listen to everything developing but now it's very different now the last I don't know, 20, 20 years or so. Um, we're, as I said, everything is jammed, everything's recorded. <clears throat> and then um, more often than not, the drums that you hear on the album are the drums, the original drums from the jam sessions. So, no my, so my job is kind of done. Um, 
and and then um, then what we tend to do is we as i said we write and arrange and record at our own studio then we usually go down to real world studios uh, peter gabriel's studio down in in bath it's a beautiful mm. place it's a great environment to work and it's kind of it's the only time where it's it's it feels to me like the old days because it's just the band it's just us in the studio with no distractions you know we get up in the morning have breakfast together record all day and then at night have dinner and then go back in and record some more or, or jam um but all we do is, at real world is we go there just to see if we can better what we've got already because right. the room's so the room's so great there um the acoustics in that room for drums are, are great and it's quite unique because the whole band are in the studio in the it's like a massive control room and with the so mike's in there at the desk the drum kit set up the whole band is in one room and um so more often than not you know we'll just go down there and try and better what we've got and if it doesn't happen it doesn't matter but right. more often than not it, it does you know um that sounds like a that, great way to work and and, re, and record an album it sounds like you guys are having a just a lot of fun doing it you know and I, no wonder yeah. i mean you have had now that was your 20th record i guess it sounds like you're working on number 21 i you know yes do you have a <laughs> do you have a timeline of, of when you guys think it it you, you're hoping to have it out maybe next year i guess that'd be nice next year but we we've kind of decided that it's it it's going to take as long as it takes um we we don't want that kind of pressure of having a deadline <laughs> right <laughs> i mean sometimes it's good for marine to have some kind of deadline otherwise it would just go on for infinity you know but yeah but um no i, I at the moment we're just saying well let's just jam and let's just uh go go with the flow and see see how it goes whenever marillion has put any under any kind of pressure to go in and come out with a product it backfires on us i think um you know in the in the days when we were with emi you know they of course they want singles you know, if sure. you've got a single and i remember one conversation with the emi guy ringing me and saying How's it going? Have you got a, a single yet? I said, well, the first piece of music is, um, you know, 20 minutes long. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> um, so yeah. you're right. You know, we kind of just do, we've always just done our own thing. And whenever yeah. we've well, been, I think that's what works. Yeah. Yeah. Whenever we've been forced to, or put under pressure to go in and actually write, say, a single, uh, I mean, we can do it. We can go in the studio in the morning and come out with a product in the evening, but it just sounds like it, it just doesn't sound right. It just sounds like it could be anybody. It's, yeah. it's not. You know. I always uh, come across your name when, when uh, uh, who, you know, you hear it, read interviews or hear interviews of other drummers who influenced them. And you're, especially in Prague, in the Prague world, your name is always mentioned, which is always great, I imagine. For you to hear but i'm wondering who were your influences and who do you listen to still uh drumming wise that that you know uh, uh, amazes you or or you're a fan of oh um quite diverse really my my i mean over the years you know when i was when i was a kid i kind of looked to america for, for all my heroes were american but there was kind of the the, the kind of big band jazz era of sure buddy buddy riches and whatnot and then in the 70s, when the whole jazz rock fusion thing happened, um, I found that really very exciting. So there were drummers like um, uh, Lenny White from Chick Career, Billy Cobham, Maravishna Orchestra. Yeah. Um, a band in the late 70s, a French band called Magma. Mm -hmm. I, I, a real, Christian Vander on drums, great drummer. Um, so just loads of, of uh, influences and, and you know, John Bonham, Keith Moon. Um, yeah, well, all over the place. Uh, but but these days, um, I really like uh, the band. I like 
Leprous. Do you know that band? Sure. Leprous. Yeah, they're yeah. fantastic. Yeah, and the drummer, uh, what's it, Bard. 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 Yeah. What a great player. I mean, super superhuman stuff. Some of it. It really is. And and um, other great players that I've, I've listened to now, and I'm and I'm friends with. Uh, you know, Simon Phillips still. Um, great, great player. Lovely guy. Um, mm -hmm. Gavin Harrison. I was was I was with him last week actually, and uh, just at his place doing. You know, we we get on very well. Um, but what a great player he is, and um, and every time I leave Gavin's house, I'll go away with a smile because he just inspires me to, to do stuff. Um, yeah, he's, an, which he's is, amazing. He is an amazing player, but he's a, he seems like a really nice guy as well and um so those are the guys I'm, I'm sort of listening to um yeah that's a great list of uh, yeah. bands and actually coming back to the cruise leprous are going to be on the next cruise for the first time i know and we're not doing it i'm gutted yeah. i'm gutted with that <laughs> I, I, I went to see them at the albert hall last year they were supporting is it uh, devon townsend De De uh yeah, i think yeah. that's that sounds right yeah yeah, they were supporting. So I went along to the Albert Hall to see them and they were fantastic. Really were great. And I met them after the show and they seemed all like nice guys. But um but yeah, I'm gutted. I, I really wanted to uh, I would have loved that to be on the cruise with them. <laughs> yeah, that would be a lot of fun. Uh but you guys are doing actually uh is it eight Marillion weekends next in twenty twenty five? Yes. Is that, is that yeah. the most you've done in one year? absolutely it is yeah yeah <laughs> it's, it's um i mean it's we're looking forward to it we're, we're doing where are we going and well, we were doing port zealand again um it, it might be the last one there because um the the center parks people uh, where we have we actually build the the venue at center parks you know it's a very big tent um in their car park and um they're refurbishing the whole place apparently and going to be filling up the car park with solar panels so we won't be able to build a venue <laughs> anymore ah, <laughs> so that's, so that's the rumor so it might it might be the last one there and then where else are we doing italy um berlin spain i think um i have, I have paris down i have montreal paris. yeah yeah, yeah montreal, quite, a, quite a so, few places that's great. I mean, I think yeah. it's it's the way you guys do it. I don't know why more bands don't do it. Do you ever you ever wonder about that? It seems like something a lot of bands could do, and well, maybe not a lot, but certain ones have probably the 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 fan base that would travel to do it. And you don't have to tour all the mm. time. You just do that cool weekend, play entire albums, play whatever you want. It seems. I mean, it's really for if you're a fan of Marillion, it it can't be anything better, I would imagine. I wonder why more bands don't do something like that. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, if you if you've got a pretty solid fan base, um, then you could start. Yeah, I don't know why they don't do it. I mean, not necessarily go 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 out and try and do the two, three thousand or four thousand people thing, but but start off small and and try and build it up. I mean. Um, but you're right. It's uh, what I love about the weekends is that, is as you say we're we're in one place for usually for three or four days, and I really like that. You know, it, it's it's less grueling for us as well sure. um, because we're not yeah. getting on planes and traveling and and um, although it's still it is hard work because you know we play a different set each night so might be six or seven hours worth of music to learn and that can be quite tricky at our age trying to yeah. keep everything in <laughs> mentally <laughs> um because you know i mean we have trouble remembering each other's names then what about that amount of music <laughs> <laughs> well but, it, uh, but it's Ian... great staying, staying, in, staying in one place for, for more than a, a few days is, is really good yeah well uh again good luck with all of those next year it sounds like it's going to be awesome i just want to recap uh, the live record uh and now before it's dark life live uh in port zealand zealand 
Uh, and um, I guess that comes out on June 21st. So you can get that everywhere. Um, yeah. I just follow Marillion on their socials to keep up to date on everything. Uh, pleasure speaking with you, man. I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to meet before uh, in person on the cruise, but I, I hopefully you'll be on one in the future again and, you know, we can say hi. Um, but I've had now, I think I've had everybody, every member of the band, except for Steve Hogarth on the podcast. So we've got to get him up uh, on the next one. <laughs> and complete oh, the, yeah, uh... we, he's good. yeah. Oh, that'd be good. He's good value, Steve. So, yeah. No, that would be good. Yeah. Well, good luck with the with your future, and and hopefully I'll meet you on on a boat somewhere at some point. Absolutely. All right, my friend. All right, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Hey, thanks for checking out the podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on all our socials and progreport.com, and we'll see you all again real soon. Thanks. <laughs>